Father, in mercy on us, we ask that thou wilt look upon us in grace because of Jesus Christ's death and blood. We can come boldly to the throne of grace because of the blood. We enter into the holiest. We no closer in heaven to thee than we are right now because of the blood of Jesus and our faith and the cleansing and the right we have as fallen man in all our shame to approach God to find through salvation and through faith in the blood of Christ the ability to be right in the holy of holies according to this book by faith and so we ask thee, because of Jesus Christ's death and his blood, his sacrifice for our lives, for our souls, and for us to have the right to be cleansed this side of heaven and have God dwelling in us, holding our hands and guiding our feet as the children of God born again, saved for eternity. How we bless thee, Jesus. The great salvation of God to you. So come, wash me in the blood of Christ. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. And by thy grace and mercy alone, speak to our hearts, all of us, even the children. In Jesus, the Christ's holy name, and for his sake, Amen. John 15 verse 4 Jesus said abide in me abide in me abide in me abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine no more can ye except ye abide in me as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine no more can ye except ye abide in me years ago as a younger preacher i came to america and one of the first tours i did of your country many years ago now I preached in a very large few thousand people convention in um, Pennsylvania. The man who organized this conference was a man called Denny Keniston. I don't know if anyone here knows Denny Keniston. Could you put your hands up if you do? Ah, well, there you are. One of the greatest privileges God ever gave me in my life was to have him as a friend and to be deeply influenced by him. He died last year, and uh, the world is poorer without this man, trust me. Denny Keniston had on his property in the old Pennsylvania, he had a workshop that he built on his grounds where his family would all unitedly and together as one person they would work with the wood to make garden furniture which they sold at the various outlets that gave them an income and for three months that little family from the smallest voyage up to the largest all the children <laughs> yet quite a tribe also but for three months they were required as a little family, that's all, three months of every year to work in that workshop. 
to produce this income through garden furniture. Now, one of the little boys, he was about so tall. So where do we find a little boy? How old are you? Eleven. Eleven. You put that down and stand up. So we see what an eleven-year-old boy looks like. Yes. <laughs> All right, you may sit. But he had a son called Samuel. Now that is a good name, is it? Of course it's not. There's Samuel. You're a bit of a than he was. But anyway, we'll pretend he's Samuel, okay? It's enough to He's been called that. They look so alive. All right, well, little Samuel, he was working with the strips of wood in his section, and that is his little part of the work. He was working this big churning blade to just take these wooden parts that he would put to his part that eventually it was all assembled. And one day, as a little boy, he was pushing this wood through, and suddenly this big churning blade caught hold of his garment and pulled his arm and cut his whole arm off. It was totally severed from the body. Now, of course, he just flaked up. And the loss of blood within minutes brought him so close to death because they just couldn't stop the flow of blood. His little family began to frantically scream and ran up to the house, weeping and crying out to God. But Jackie, Denny's wife, came down, rushing with the other older children. Denny was away at that time, and they rushed. And all of them weeping as they just saw him flake down and the blood just spreading across the floor. They all panicked and they all frantically just crying and weeping to God to please spare them and to spare his life. And so Jackie, taking the one leg and the other children, the other arms and the legs, and carried him as he was close to death, just carried him up to the vehicle. One of the children. One of the small children picked up the arm and ran after them to the vehicle. They went to the closest hospital and just by a matter of, I believe, God's sovereignty, there's something, as you look back in life, you just see the hand of God must have been in that. Because they just happened to be visiting surgeons. They were able to attempt an uncomprehendable feat to reattach that arm. First, they had to get enough blood back in him to keep him from dying. When he was able to be worked upon, they, these surgeons attempted to reattach the arm. The veins, the muscles, the bone structure, somehow to reattach that arm that was totally severed off. And that to me is uncomprehendable. I would have thought that's not possible, but it is. And we've never leave really God out of anything medical science can do. See, God gave men wisdom to do that. Don't leave God out of it. Even if it isn't people praying for God. Many times God expects us to trust the wisdom he's given to doctors and surgeons. And to acknowledge him, especially as Christians. And to pray for wisdom and carefulness and protection as these people use the wisdom they've been given to keep us alive. So, that to me is so wonderful that God could do that by giving men wisdom to do that. Now I saw Sam, he's a grown man now, and he has children just about his age. When I saw him, he's growing up so far. I saw him a year or two ago in some meeting I was preaching at. And Samuel's arm can function perfectly. Though it was totally detached from the body. There's no less strength there. It's, it functions perfectly. And to me that is wonderful. But now I need to ask something of everyone here. I need to ask every one of you. And I wonder if I could ask you to do something you've never done before. Everyone. I want you to be utterly honest with yourself. And with God in this moment. I don't care who you are. Have you 
in shell, literally cut off from an abiding life in Christ, which is imperative for your survival as a Christian. I want to repeat that. According to Christ himself in John 15 and many other passages, have you been severed from an abiding life in Christ, outside of which nothing is nothing. Nothing will ever be seen or witnessed of God's working in your life. You will be a tragedy to even say you're saved. Because your life cannot produce one thing of the fruit of the Spirit and Christ like this outside of abiding in Christ. You cannot have any fruit. You see, this abiding in Christ is not an act of faith. At the moment of salvation, by faith you are grafted into the body of Christ. You become a member of his body. By grace through faith, just an act of faith in the shed blood of Christ, you are saved, you have become part of the body of Christ. That's faith, but this abiding in Christ has nothing to do with that. This is a discipline that God puts the onus on you, straight into your hands, that you choose. You see, the free will doesn't stop when you get saved. It's every day that you have to choose. It's a choice. That you could be a tragedy and bring shame on God's name daily, beginning in your own home. You could be the reason your children go to hell. No other reason. Saying you're a Christian, telling you to get saved, but not having what God says, it's impossible. That any fruit could ever, unless you have a abiding. In the rest of the scriptures, we hear this term abiding that Jesus said in, uh, in 1 John. Chapter 3, verse 6. Whoso abideth, whoso abideth in him, sinneth not, John says. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. There's no victory. There's no victory. No victory in Christianity outside of this. There's no possibility of any victory in your life outside of an abiding. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. There's victory in Christ, but it's through this. 1 John 2 28. Now, little children, Abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. I want to repeat that, what John says to all of us. Now, little children, abide in him. He's not speaking about little children here, yeah? but everyone <coughs> that is saved, he looks upon them as babes in Christ, and I teaching us. Now the children abide in him. That when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed at his coming. This is God's word, not mine. It is imperative for your survival as a Christian without bringing shame on God's name and whatever that verse means, that is addressed in Christians at Christ's appearing. 1 John 2, verse 4. He that saith he abideth in him. He that saith he does the one thing Christ said you have to do to bear any fruit. Outside of which you will be a disgrace, you won't even be recognized. People will be shocked to hear you say you're a Christian. <laughs> He that saith he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. There's Christ likeness in the life. He that saith he abideth in him, ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Christ like, to be like Christ. This is the result. You want to know what's the most obnoxious thing you will ever see in your life? You think some wickedness in the street or in evil places? No. 
the most obnoxious thing you will ever see in life is a Christian. There is nothing of Christ likeness in him. There's nothing of Christ likeness in him. That is the most shattering and obnoxious thing you will ever witness in your life to say that you're saved, you're Christ, you belong to Jesus as he's in you. This is imperative. It is vital. This abiding life in Christ is a discipline of communion with God. And that costs everything. You say it doesn't? Well, you try to never neglect everything that's needed for you to be abiding in Christ. As a result of a discipline, we call it the quiet time, the meditation of God's word. I'll tell you what a quiet time is. It's not having an hour with God's word and prayer. That's nothing. It's an hour or more, or whatever God gives you or requires of you, where you don't get up and walk out and say, there, I've had my quiet time. I've done this. My conscience is done. That's not a quiet time. You get up if you had any, anything of a valuable quiet time, any value to God or yourself or man. If you're able to get up, and as a result of the time you spend with God, you're able to walk with God, not leave him behind now. You the entire day. Outside of that, you have an adequate. I'm not talking about working yourself up in emotion. I'm talking about the promises that God gives them. If you just meditate the word of God. The word of God has something without any emotion that is renewing you day by day, outside of which you will never know. The meditating of the word of God. This abiding life in Christ not a crisis prayer. To me, that's a tragedy when only crisis will make you pray from your shore and commune with God. That's why God allows so much crisis to come in your life. You think it's the devil? When things go wrong, tell me, is that the only time God gets from you something from your heart, your whole being, looking in faith, earnestly and every faculty of your being responding to communion and to need God. Do you wonder why so much goes right, goes wrong in your life? If that's the only time God will ever find anything from you, do you wonder that that's what he's going to have to do for the rest of your life? Christ is spread is not what I'm speaking about. That is really tragic if that's all God can do to get away from you. That's real in communion with him. I'm talking about a, an abiding, an abiding communion in God, abiding in Christ, abiding life in Christ. If Enoch could walk with God sooner, it's not in the Bible for our interest to tell you that you can. There's nothing in the Bible that's there just for historical records. From Genesis 1 to the end, it's written for you to have the heart of God and to be able to walk with God. There's nothing that doesn't, even the statements God gives to people like Enoch. I want to ask you again, have you been cut off from an abiding life in Christ? Have somehow, through all the things in life, though you're saved, there's nothing, nothing in you that even mounts up to desire it anymore. Even if you're a tragedy, and the only thing that will make you see God desperately in communion is if everything collapses in life. And that's tragic. That is tragedy. Christianity is tragic. It is tragedy. It's not a joy someone who doesn't put God first, who doesn't find this life because other things matter more, even if it's a disgrace to humanity, let alone Christianity. If this has happened to you, and you're honest tonight, and I'm begging everyone to say no who you are, a little boy, an old man, a pastor, I don't care who you are. If this tragic state is what you are, then I'm imploring you, 
Don't leave yourself in that condition for the winter night. I'm imploring you for my soul that you seek God to do the uncomprehendable. That you can be once again one with him, abiding in him, not just the act of faith, but the discipline required from you that God put the onus on you. It's up to you. God wants it from you, but God will never make it. You're never forced to. You need to seek God to be reattached. You remember when you were first saved? If you truly were saved, let me tell you that's what God wanted to continue, only to grow. Where you never neglected God. Where every moment you could find was with the Word of God. Where every opportunity you could find was to commune, to witness, to seek God's grace to you. It was an abundance. But what is it now? We need to seek God desperately. You see, if you have an operation like that emergency operation on little Samuel Kenston, where his arm was detached and you are cut off as radically and as tragically as that. With any operation, you have to have cleansing. Do you know in Africa, more people die going to surgery than if they'd stayed away. Because there's ignorance in so much, so much of Africa concerning you have to change. You're in more danger going to those medical people who don't even have cleansing and you end up dying because it's all in the newspapers. But somehow, and we have to seek cleansing if we expect God to do anything of a spiritual operation to reattach us. There's always cleansing. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us. Christians, not unsaved, from all sin. You have to come to God by faith in the blood, but the blood of Jesus Christ will only cleanse us if we confess God's sins. Our sin, what we are, all the sin of neglecting God, the other sins are all the result of the biggest sin. Your great sin is not that way you keep asking God to help you. Your great sin is neglecting God. There's no greater sin in your life. That's more grievous to God because these other sins that you worry about and ashamed of would never be there if you were not committing a worse sin. You have to come confessing to God that you neglected God himself or everything else. You have to come seeking God by faith to cleanse you. And by faith to cast yourself upon his grace to be able to reattach you. No matter what condition you are, don't lie in hopelessly, helplessly, numb, and just let the devil keep you numb to death and second best that God could ever give you. You never knew God's grace. Come and ask God to reattach you, to somehow do the amazing, uncomprehendable, to bring you back. Come in faith, no matter what it costs you. Come in faith that God can bring you back into an abiding life in Christ. And you will. Hold him down to He wants it more than you want by a billion times for his glory and his purposes in your life. He will if you come with every faculty of your being and every bit of faith and honesty and integrity and regard that's more important than anything else you do in life. Your studies, your work, your dreams, your ambitions, even if you're a preacher, your activities, even if it's religion is sin, if it keeps you from God. That's why so many preachers fall into sin. Because they cannot survive because they're preachers. You survive if you abide in Christ. If you have this great discipline in your life outside of which you will bring shame to God, even if you're a world famous preacher. Don't think you're going to get away with it, sir. You need to see God. Before we go any further in the sermon, I want to look at his family. His family, witnessing this terrible tragedy, didn't stand there and look at him and condemn him. His family didn't stand there 
and begin to criticize and say, well, you, the negligence and all this now bring all this enough. I mean, that's unthinkable. What family in their right mind would you find would actually stand there and criticize him as he lay there in this condition? But we're a family. Let me shock you. The family of God is many times, even though you might not realize it, it crosses real closer than your own blood family. Mm. Once you have one father and you're adopted into Christ, we become the children of God. And they are our family, brothers and sisters. But what person in your right mind would, on a human level, stand there criticizing if someone was in that condition? And so with the family of God, I want us to ask ourselves, what do we do? What do we actually do? And now this is a staggering question because God, God confronts us. God confronts us concerning us being the family of God and the children of God. God, as our Heavenly Father, exalts us as His children, the children, the family of God, in Scriptures, in Galatians 6 verse 1, If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. That's a staggering statement. If a man, brethren, brothers, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. In the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You've got to be careful. I have known many a preacher going to help someone who's fallen into sin and falls into the same sin. He falls badly. Be careful. Preacher, if you're alone with the lady, vice versa. I know some of the greatest preachers in this world, it was the end of their ministry when they went to help. And they were tempted being alone with someone who really, they should never have been alone. Who professed to be saved. Did that to us. Multitude stumbled over him because he had led so many. Well, if a man be overtaken in a fault, literally in its context, tragically falls into sin, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one. You want to know who's spiritual? I think it's the pastor, the elders, the youth leaders. No, just let someone fall into sin, and you'll find out who is spiritual within a second. Those that condemn, get her out, shake her out. Nothing to do with that. No, God looks to those that are spiritual. He, he addresses them. I'm looking to you, God says. And you will find out who's spiritual the moment someone falls, no matter who it is that falls into sin that's a saved man. Be careful how you react to God's children. If another one of God's children stab your lies and tragic, tragic. Be careful. Don't stand there condemning. Be careful. He which is spiritual. Restore. So how? How will we know who God looks to? How will we even know who's spiritual when this happens? Well, in 1 John, John tells us twice in the same letter what we must do if sin comes in a Christian's life. Firstly, in 1 John 2 verse 1, what we must do sin comes in our life. My little children, he's not writing to little children, but to the age of John to everyone, whether you're 90 years old or 6 years old or 20 years old. Your babes in Christ when you come. So my little children, he says, on a spiritual level, these things write I unto you that you sin not. Now preach that or leave the book. There's victory in Christ, and you've got to preach it. These things write unto you that he's in a but that's half a verse. Be careful, don't be like a Jehovah Witness. You can only quote half a verse, but you dare not look at the other half, and it cancels out what he says, the meaning. So he's half a verse. Don't do that. We can look at the next half of the verse. These things write I unto you that you sin not. 
I don't want it, God says. But if any man, any Christian in this context sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sin. Taken from Leviticus 16, he's the mercy seat where the high priest would go and sprinkle the blood of the mercy seat. This is just a picture of right now what Christ is doing. But he has his blood that he shows the Father and he ever liveth to make intercession for He ever liveth to make intercession for us, whereby he's able to save them to the uttermost who come to him through God, who come to God through him. You see, he stands there with his blood and he makes a decision. We have not an high priest which cannot be moved with the feeling of our infirmities in all points tempted like as we yet without sin. Therefore, let us come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy. And grace to help in time of need. You see, we don't come brazenly. We come in shame if we sin. But come boldly. Don't let the devil keep you down because you fell and fell into sin. No. Brother, sister, you have no right to give up if you're saved. You have no right. Let me tell you why. Because the same God that we put our faith in the promises he gave concerning the shed blood of Christ and for the forgiveness of sins to be saved. He knew. He knew that there's the possibility that you could fall. He knew, though you were saved, you turned off the broad road, you turned you on the narrow road, which leads to life, which is the exact opposite. You're facing everybody, beginning in your own home. The members of a man's home will become the enemies. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. He knew all the power of hell against you is the possibility of falling. And God says, get up. If you fall, don't give up. Get up. That's staggering, but that's what the Bible says. You have no right to give up. The same God that promised you forgiveness and changing your blood when you were saved, he has other promises to you if sin comes, not whenever. If you just go on sinning and read 1 John 3, two chapters later, the next chapter, that tells you you're not saved if you just in sin, you never turn from it. And God made you a new creature and set you free from enslavement and sin. No, but if on your road to the celestial city, with all the power of hell against you, God knew the possibility you could fall. And God gives you promises. Promising you that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us. Present continuous tense and salvation. The right to your life is there. And he stands at the mercy seat and makes a decision for you. You get up and remember, if any man sin, any Christian in this context, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. Christians, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That's if they come to repentance and faith in Christ's blood. Yes. But then John doesn't only speak once about if Christians sin. If sin comes in a Christian, then what we do? Then he deals with if you, if you fall into sin, what to do? Don't give up, get up, confess. And the blood will cleanse. But then he also speaks about if you see another Christian sin. 1 John chapter 5, 20. If any man see his brother sin, if any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. What does it mean to sin unto death? Oh, we're well, not speaking about the blessing of the Holy Ghost, the unpardonable sin. How it comes into this context, no one's going to explain. So I'm not going to. But the only time you will ever commit an unpardonable, unforgivable sin in this world is the blessing of the Holy Ghost. And that is the only occasion. In the entire Bible, where this is mentioned, is when the Pharisees, in their anger, in their evil heart, knowing that he was good, wanted to catch him in his word, wanted him dead. They were serving God, they believed. In the ordained religion of God, when the God manifested in the flesh was there, they were so wicked, they wanted him dead. They saw it. They 
They were so jealous and so full of anger at the rebuke of their hypocrisy by the word of God. Oh, my brother, they said the spirit that works in him to perform all these miracles that are turning the world upside down is the spirit of Beelzebub, the devil. To say that the Holy Spirit that performed the miracles and the power of God through him to perform the great miracles that turned the world upside down at that time. To say that that is the devil, Satan working through Christ, is the only unpardonable sin in life. Be careful you don't throw them into another category. I know many people who think they did commit the impartial and they didn't. The fact that they have any desire or any fear means they haven't. Trust me. And I have other sermons on the internet or all these websites that I deal with that, but not tonight. But to get back to this, if any man see his brother sin, what does he do? What does she do? It's a telephone. I don't remember. I saw him with my own eyes. I saw him sin. The hypocrite. He stands there with a Bible preaching. The hypocrite. I saw him with my own eyes. Who I saw him. What sort of a woman is this? What? I saw this. Oh, my goodness me. When you get to the end of the book, what are you going to do now? Who else can I? Let me tell you something to shock you. You want to spread news in this world faster than the television newscasts of your America? Just tell a Christian. Just tell a Christian. And the news will spread like fire. Let me tell you why, because there's such shallowness today. And I believe this across the world. And all the devil needs to do is to show a Christian somewhere for himself. No. If any man see his brother's sin, a sin, which is not only that he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Yes, God will say, if a man see, you come to God. And you cry, oh God, what I've seen, please don't let anybody else see. Please protect this person, this preacher. Please protect this woman, protect this man. Because if anyone sees God, he will never be trusted in the pulpit again. His children will never look at him again with trust or love. Only fear. His wife will never trust him. He loses everything in life. If this is seen by others, what I've seen, oh, God, protect it. No one else sees it. And this doesn't destroy it. But, oh, God, in thy mercy, come upon him and show him. Show him the danger. Show him the wrong. Come upon him in a way that will unnerve him to make him seek thee, God. Oh, then he stops, God. And you cry. You know what God says? I believe heaven stands. If there is such a person on earth left in respect, I believe God puts himself in a holy obligation because of such integrity and such compassion, and such a heart after God's heart. And God promises he shall ask this cry of compassion and integrity for this man to not be destroyed but protected and restored. But God promises he shall ask in such a way and he shall give him life. For them that sin not unto death, God will restore that man. That's the first thing you're required to do. You know how spiritual you are if someone falls into sin by how you pass it on or how you keep it and protect him and only pass it on to God with such a desperation that God and heaven want to intervene. And well, because he put himself in holy obligation. Let me shock you. God will normally bring that person right up to you to be the means to restore him. If you pray like that. I can't tell you how many preachers and Christians across this world that God somehow let me know or find out that came straight as soon as I began to cry. I remember reading a newspaper one day, having a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, waiting for people to fetch me. Back in my country, 
And on the front page of the newspaper, there was a big write-up about a man who killed his children and his wife. So the whole family is dead. My heart to say to know a man could, his mind could so collapse that he did that. To the gifts God had given him, lives as a family, to kill them all. And I remember weeping. I just started weeping in that restaurant. In such a brokenness, and I began to pray for him. In spite of what he did, my heart broke, and I just broke for him. I said, God, this could be from a Christian home. Just before she from a godly home, because I mean, men won't ever happen in my mind. Fresh meat. I've seen that on more than one occasion, even in your country. I've shattered in a godly show with two little women killed with them, shot people. Be careful. God, there might be godly people who love me that I even know, that I might have seen in the old, in any other man's name. Within two hours, a phone goes, I did know him this one. I did know his godly family, godly mother and father, and other brothers and sisters. And they asked me to go to the prison now, the psychiatric section, trying to assist with this man who was able to stand any trial, even if he had the ability mentally to be able to stand the trial, to be judged. So he was put in this prison with psychologists, all these workers. But he was in prison, trying to assess what he was able to do. He judged, to stand trial. So I walked in, I shouted him, he stood in there, a wreck of a human. And the police were all standing around the building, watching psychologists or the wards. It was a large group, but they wouldn't let me say one word without standing right next to me, listening to what I say to them, what he's going to say to me. They looked at me, and they began to sob, and then he said, don't tell me that there's any forgiveness from God for me, sir. God will never, ever be able to show me mercy what I've done. No. Don't tell me, don't come here to me that I need to see God for mercy. There's no such a thing as forgiveness. I had a Bible and I began to speak to him. With such compassion as I wept because he was weeping. You know, suddenly the police the psychologists, the warders, all started sobbing, every one. The one was sobbing so violently he had to walk out. You see, I suddenly realized God was ministering to them mm -hmm. in bringing me here. Not only to him, to show him there is mercy. No matter what a man does, you've got to go to him. You dare not give up anyone, and God never gave me a right. What right have I to give up anyone in this world? and say there's no worth, no use, and that he's worthless. No, no, I give up on no one. I have no right to. God never gave up on me. You that is speech. Any one of you see. Start interceding, God normally brings you right to them. I've seen that again and again, and again and again and again and again and again and again. Now, beloved, we dare not be saved from abiding life in Christ, which is imperative for our survival as a Christian, a deed. Discipline of communion with God as our greatest discipline in life every day of our life from the day we're saved to the day we die is the greatest priority and responsibility of every one of you, or you will bring shame on God's name. There's nothing that Christ will be seen in you. You'll send your children to hell, sir. Telling them about hell because your life will be. Boys, remember. 
that any relationship with God that is of any meaningfulness is obtained and maintained primarily through the meditating of the sacred book. I want to repeat that. If you forget everything in the sermon, Christian, don't forget this, I'm begging you. Always remember, any relationship with God that's meaningful is obtained and maintained primarily through the unhurried meditation of the sacred pages of this book daily. Outside of it, there's no such a thing. You can watch a billion films on Christianity and be ungodly. But this book, or this book, primarily, it's obtained primarily and maintained through the meditating of the sacred pages of this book. But how? Why would this be so? Well, I remember preaching over 47 years of preaching now. But I remember how people would arrange meetings up to seven a day, up to the next place. Whoa. And so I'm leaving now this one town where I've preached from one school to the other. There's still be a sandwich, I could have a thousand, sometimes more children, for half an hour, 40 minutes. And the privileges they've given me, then to the prisons, and then to the old age homes, and then to these, whoa, seven meetings in one day. So I'm driving now, after all this, we're driving now 50, 60 miles to get to the next town, because the next morning we had to be up early to go and preach in a breakfast service in one of the big restaurants in the next town. So, we get to the next place, we're going to stay in a farm for the night, which is about 10 miles outside of the town. A very godly farmer, and his wife and family. And I said to this man, who was driving with the other workers in other cars, all this convoy of cars, all those that arranged all the meeting duty, I said to him, listen, you nearly killed me. You nearly murdered me today. He says, what, what, what? He was really upset and shocked. And yes, you try and preach seven times a day. <laughs> and I said, listen, don't worry, it's a good way to die. <laughs> and after this, I said, don't you tell me to go and leave. You say, come and we're waiting for us to be late. I'm not going after seven services, after sitting all this way, just standing, sitting, praying. Now I was going to sit with this family that I haven't seen for a year. No, you go in. You sit. I'm going for a walk. Or I'm going to die. <laughs> so I left him to take my bags and I just walked before I could see anybody that could sit me down and talk. Oh, I need to walk. You see, that's how I stayed alive. That's how most preachers, if they do stay alive, most die young because they forget they're human. But I go for walks. As a discipline. So I walk and I walk and I go, oh, I have had walk. On this farm, which is perhaps the most prosperous farm in southern Africa, I doubt anyone could have made. He has proof on government level the discussion and how the farming can affect the nation. This is a godly man who owns his farm, just going over the hills, down the valleys, over the lakes, and all oh, the beauty of the mountains, the woods. It's just, I'm a, and there is this farm road, this track road that the, the, the implements have made to get all these farming implements every part of the country. I walked over the hill. Oh, then I looked down this massive lake with all these wonderful birds, all the ducks and the geese and all these birds are swooping down. It was, and the clouds, and then the hills, and oh, and then there's the cliffs. And I walked and I walked and I walked briskly. Oh, and I was enjoying my mind clears up, I'm getting back oxygen to my brain, and I'm getting communion with God. You know, I don't worship the creation, I worship the God of creation. All these beautiful mountains and valleys and cliffs and water. And ah, they went on and on walking. But I made a mistake. You see, I wasn't thinking of the time. And suddenly I thought to myself, oh, I've walked a long way, and you know, it's getting dark. How am I going to find my way back to the farm? And if I looked at it, I can hardly see the road. It's going, winter just gets up. There's no road lights, there's no road anywhere. Just this track. And I have walked a long, long way. Now I thought, oh my, look how dark it's getting. I can hardly see anywhere now. It just, so I started to run. I do, even if I'm nearly 70, okay? Trust me, I run. When no one's looking in my suit many times, I want to stay alive. I'd ran, I've ran all these runners. We don't have to talk about that. 
<laughs> I didn't know I was doing it, by the way, in case you think I'm proud. <laughs> they nearly died trying to keep up with this old man. That was about a few years ago. But nonetheless, I run. So I start running. And whoa, whoa, whoa. I can't see the fumble, I can't see. You know, suddenly it was so dark that I honestly couldn't see my hand. The pitch dark. What's going to happen? I'm going to fall off a cliff. I'm going to roll down that mess of you. And I looked down and was wondering at all the beauty. I'm a, where is the road? I'm a, and I really began to panic. Anyway, suddenly, the most amazing thing happened. There were rocks all over this road, this ground road, that began to illuminate like a golden red. It was good geographically in that area. I don't know what it was, but these rocks on the road, because the, the road had been leveled off, and there was no vegetation, it was just ground. They were illuminating because the stars and the moons, but they were like bright lights. Now I stood there and I looked. And over the hill, I could see the road, the lights. It was like a, a lit up road over the next hill, up the next mountain, over down. I could, couldn't see the farm, but I, all fear was gone. I thought, well, what am I running for? Let me enjoy the walk. The whole road is illuminated by these rocks. Just because of the stars. So I began to walk and praise the Lord. And then I'm walking all over the hill, you know what? Now, this is what God's word is to us in this dark world. These rocks, the word of God is full of commandments and promises, but you can't just take the promises. You've got to take the, these rocks and follow obedience. You've got to embrace by faith the promises and the commandments. And as you obey and you embrace, it doesn't matter how dark this world is. It doesn't matter how dark this world is going to become before Christ and it's going to. In moral decadence, every evil that's going to rise up, it doesn't matter. You are safe. You have peace that passes all understanding. Why? Because thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Is this the promises, the commandments? They're a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. Now, beloved. There's so many promises telling us this. This is the only light we've got. Proverbs 6.23. The commandment is a lamp. The law is a light. You see, that's what they had when they wrote this. We have the whole Bible. Whenever you go, I used to remember the young Christian. Oh, 20, what, two when I first started preaching. 20, just, two. well, I remember how I would wear out. We're not so fast these days because God told me what you should do and shouldn't do. In those days I did everything more than for it. So I would stop the car. And I would look at these valleys and I would say, I'm going for a walk before I get to the next town. I need it. There was young Andrew Murray who to work with me. I'm not the old Andrew Murray, I'm not that old, okay? <laughs> but he's a great grandson. He was my best man, and we worked together for a long, long time, many parts of Africa. The two of us, what a godly young man. But the two of us were very young. Now, the fire, not much wisdom, but there you are. The fire was all that was needed. So let's never give up. It's a go. You know, what the devil did to you next time? Every soul was wrong. Preaching every night. Oh. Now, I would stop the car many times and say, even those days, listen, we're not going to the next town. We're nearly dead. We so poured ourselves out into all these tragic homes and all these people and all the meeting. We're going to stop the car. We're going to climb that mountain. He says, what? We've got a preach. I said, no. You get there and talk. You've got to stay alive, Andrew. Let's climb that mountain and stay alive. <laughs> okay. So he's guilty, but we're plodding along. No. Climb the mountain, we got up the top after about three hours or something. And what did we find? We find a soul. Up in some watchtower, watching for the fires, with all the mountains and the hills and the trees. And we led them to Christ. Hallelujah! So we knew why we went up that mountain. He was sitting there for weeks waiting for the next person to come with his radio and control, and warm, and that's where he was dropped. Anyway, we led him to Christ. 
But nonetheless, I have stopped so many times in so many valleys, and I've walked down these valleys and up the... But you know, every single path in Africa that I've walked on, I can't think of one that didn't come up to a river. Whatever, whoever made that path, the land, there it comes to a river. And the track, the path continues the other side of the river, but here there's water. Deep water. And there's the path going on there, but the person who made, the people who made the track or the path always put stepping stones in the water. Doesn't matter how deep, there were stones. I always learned, they firm. You just had to cross the waters. You cross with your feet in faith on those stepping stones. You take it to go through the deepest, most dangerous rapids sometimes I've done it. And it always was there. No one jumped out there. Isaiah 43, verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, saith the Lord. Through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee, scorch thee. This is not speaking about waters physically or fires physically. This is speaking about the waters. God never says you're not going to go through deep waters, Christian, or face fires. He actually tells you in this world, you shall have tribulation. You know what that is? Total onslaught. I'm sick. There's temptation, there's affliction, but there's tribulation. Total onslaught. God promises you it's coming. When you go through the deep waters, you're going to. He doesn't say you won't go through deep. You won't go. He doesn't say you won't go through deep fires. He tells you, but they won't harm you. Faith comes by the word of God. We take the promise, the stepping stone, and like the promise and the commandments over any water, anything that you face, and you're not going to be harmed, sir. God has a holy obligation, and that's where faith comes from. That you don't live in fear as you face all these things in this world. The first thing we dare not neglect or cut ourselves off from a vital relationship and communing with God. But secondly, we dare not neglect or cut ourselves off from a vital relation, from a vital fellowship with the godly. Firstly with God and now we dare not neglect or cut ourselves off from vital fellowship with the godly. In the scripture, in 1 John 1 verse 7, John says, if we walk in the light, you can. Oh, God has no right to ask of us. Then he's mocking us. The light you've been given, it doesn't mean you've got all the light. The path of the just, those who are right in the religion of God, is a shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. Not one of us has attained that until we die. The perfectness. Not as though I already attained either, we're already perfect, but I follow Paul said that we're not perfect. But the light we're given, we can walk in the light that God gives us. Or God can't ask it of us. But that's why we need that light. Blood of Jesus Christ. You see, sins committed in ignorance. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth not to him it is sin. We need the blood, no matter how much victory God gives us. Just come at the end of the day. And so don't say, Thank you, God, that I didn't sin. Say, Thank you, God, for the victory, but thank you for the blood. Because of the light that's still coming. But I'm walking in the light. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Now that's not speaking about fellowship with God, that's speaking about fellowship with each other. If you're walking in the light God's given you, you have genuine, meaningful fellowship with the godly, or you're not walking in the light and you're in danger. You have fellowship. Hebrews 10 verse 25, not forsaking, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. But exhorting, that's encouraging one another. And so much the more as we see the day approaching. It doesn't necessarily mean that you stop going to church. No, that doesn't mean anything about that. You see, you can attend a godly church with the best preacher on earth, with the godliest, and you can cut yourself off 
because you're there just out of obligation to your parents. You're not there to, you're there to save face. It doesn't mean that you stop going to church, that you don't have meaningful fellowship with each other that's vital and imperative for your survival as a Christian. You can close your heart. You can, as a young person, look at the godliness of the goddess and simply say, no, let me look who's playing the fool. I defend him. That's who I mean. I'm not interested in going there all the way like this in every aspect of Christianity. No, you can close your heart to the sun. You can listen to the greatest preacher in your community and close your heart. You can go to church and cut yourself off. You don't have to stop going to church to do that, beloved. Be careful. You will suffer the consequences. You will become a living tragedy. I guarantee you, because that's your heart. And your heart in every aspect of Christianity doesn't want God in truth. It doesn't want what it costs. It doesn't want it. Be careful now. Be careful now. Why do we have to seek out the godliest place and the godliest people? You know, my wife and I had an incredible experience a little while ago. I was touring our country, part of Africa, that was uh, arranged by a whole lot of people. It was a very great privilege to many thousands of people over a long period of time. Six week tour. The telephone goes, Mr. Daniel, sir, there's a very grave situation risen up. And we need you desperately to come. I said, Can you give dip? Sir, all I'm asking. It is a critical, it is a crisis, it is critical. And I'm asking you, Mr. Daniel, that we see on your newsletter, your program, your six weeks story, but in the middle is five days that's open. And those five days are so critical, we want you to come the first one. Those five days, please come, sir, we need you. And we also require your wife, because she is really needed in this situation. So I said, well, we'll fly her, we'll fly her from Cape Town, 2,000 miles. We'll fly you. But please come to this place that's arranged where we will gather, where we, we want you to be. And we, so, what do we do? I phoned Jenny. I said, well, Jenny, it must be the leaders of the movement, the mission of the society, somebody that's prominent and known across Africa. And some must have come because they want you. It must be a marriage or something. But we better go. So they flew Jenny. They fly me in a helicopter. Get me there in time from where I was. And uh, to the border of our country. And we drive there. I see Jenny hug. Beautiful, magnificent hotel where we thought, well, this is where they're going to meet a lot of people. And, uh, I asked the people, uh, we've been asked to come, we've arranged everything, flying here, there's some crisis. Because this man didn't know what I was talking about, he didn't know who I was. I said, surely after all this, don't tell me. I said, listen, there's people who said we've got to come in. What is it? They bring others in. I said, well, some crisis. And wait, so they went and got the owners of this hotel. And his lady, oh, are you Mr. Daniel? Yes, oh, we know all about you. Uh, yes, you're the crisis. It's what? It's critical. You leave your wife alone for six weeks preaching, <laughs> they say. And that these people, they will never know who they are, said that this, this is critical. We've got to get them together. So, what have they done? They brought you to the best hotel. That only wealthy people from across the world come to, to the Kruger National Park, which is the best game reserve in the world. Trust me, not this thing, the Serengeti, which is five nations surrounding the thousand, two thousand months. This is where millions go to see all the animals of Africa and to see hundreds of them as you travel. Oh, so they have five star hotels, four star hotels, three star hotels, two star hotels, one star hotels. No stars. <laughs> or the poor. <laughs> and then they have tents for the really poor. And trust me, you want to read the things that have happened since I was a boy for years to those who are roaring and 
<laughs> you don't want to stay in tension. <laughs> but, uh, things have happened. None of this. Here we are in a five-star hotel. And we we are given five days in the best hotel where millionaires come. You know, shall I look at Jenny? She looks at me, and these people are looking at us, and we're looking sheepishly that I'm in a crisis with my marriage, according to the world. <laughs> so I smile at them, mm, a second honeymoon. <laughs> so we walk to the bedroom, we led through there. Trust me, you won't believe it. The bedroom is double the size, no, no exaggeration, with a wall to wall bed. I said, who in their right mind would want a bed like this unless you've got 50 children who <laughs> all insist on sleeping with my life? Anyway, we jumped in the bed like a trampoline. Don't tell my own, by the way. We had a wonderful time to show to you I can still do these somersaults. <laughs> but anyway, there we are, we go to the bar. Now, trust me, this bar for you will not believe it. I said, nobody in their right mind would have a boyfriend in the world. What for? You know, you dive on the deep end. True. <laughs> <laughs> then they have this evening of out in the open there in Africa with chandeliers and these fellows just like butlers, you know. Coming along with these seven course meals, and oh, then they, the entertainment of the Zulu warriors gone to the point. You don't want to see that, but still, <laughs> there you are. And then this man says to me, this young Christian man, who is the guide of the tour guide, he says, Mr. Daniel, I require that you will be ready at five o'clock in the morning. Can you? You know, Mrs. Daniel, we want to take you out. To see all the big five, the lions, the elephants, what else are there? Hippopotamuses, rhinoceros, well, anyway, the big, we want to show you so much in the morning before lunch. And very few game reserves can offer that, but we're going to do that for you. But we want you to be at five so we can get back at two o'clock in the afternoon to the hotel. So we have to leave early. So I said, okay, so we get on this big tank, you know, it's like an armored tank, <coughs> like this high. And uh, lovely cushioned seats and oh, no coverings, no protection. And these lions, about 40, we, I think we counted, suddenly surrounding it, looking at oh, and, oh, and I said, uh, don't they jump up because there's no protection? <laughs> you know, they will never jump up. It's, it's unheard of. They will never jump up onto such a vehicle. You're safe. You don't have to have protection. I will help you right. <laughs> you know. So we're driving. So, oh, look down there. Elephants, you can't believe. I mean a few hundred. The little ones holding mommy's tail with their chunks, you know, and they're just going together, the families. Oh no, it was a two one. He said, Oh, look up there, this tree. So park told, there's a tiger watching us and looking down at us, you know, this big thing. Perched up on one road. Yes, cheetahs, the fastest animal in the world. So don't take a charge like some of these people do. They get out of the vehicle, and they think he's far away, but he's a full fossil within a second. The people have been killed. Oh, so we're going on. We see all these buffalo and one thing after the other. And then he says, Go look down there in the valley. Let's go down there. So off this little track, down this armored thing, like an armored tank, down. He takes us. Here's giraffes, these tall, magnificent creatures. Taller than this. They're so tall, they eat off the treetops. The other animals have to eat in the grass. So let's go down. And there was, I don't know how many hundred giraffes, beautiful, these magnificent things. So high, and so beautiful, and so graceful. And they're driving around them, and they look at us because they're used to the tourists. But under the giraffes at their legs, there were hundreds and hundreds of zebras, all walking with the giraffe. Wherever they walk, they walk. Hundreds turning, following the giraffe. You know what a zebra, you know what a zebra is, don't you? It's a, uh, like a horse that you paint white strips around. <laughs> That's basically what a zebra is. Nonetheless, suddenly the giraffe start going. They look like they're going gracefully. All the zebras, hundreds of them, run. 
trying to keep up with me. You try and keep up with the vehicle. You can't believe how these graceful things are going. Where are you going? And poor two zebras running. And then when there's a rough stop, the zebras stop. They all start grazing again. And I said to him, how come all these zebras are with the giraffes? How come so many under? And when the giraffes run, all of them, did you see that? They all run off them. So he turned around, he stopped the vehicle, and he says, what? What did you just say? Everybody's looking at me now. I said, how come the zebras follow the giraffes? He says, goodness me, there's someone intelligent in this world. <laughs> so now I'm looking sheepishly, everybody's looking at me. <laughs> oh, it's well, the people that live. He said, I have been a long, long time uh, awarded to the note going around the game. And he says, I have long for someone to ask me why <laughs> the zebras follow the giraffes. He says, well, in the end, I always said, why do you think the zebras are following me? Someone actually asked me. They're sitting there looking at me in stone shock, you know. Says, Let me tell you why. Because the giraffes reach this point, he was alive. And they can see far off. Predators. Immediately, they have these eyes that can see so far. It's something like a magnified of what a human is. And they see danger coming where other animals don't. And the predators, these lions, come through the ground. They didn't even know they're there. But these, in the moment they realize, they turn and they go at such a speed. These zebras are intelligent. They know they can't see far. Away. They know these dogs can. And they're safe. When the giraffe runs, they run. When the giraffe stops, safe again. They know they're safe. They don't have to live in fear. Let me tell you, that is why we cannot forsake the assembly of ourselves together. As God says, if you walk in the light that is in the white, we have fellowship. We cannot dare to be cut ourselves off from such things because there's safety go to the godliest of the godly you will ever find don't go to these mega churches where there's this young people through the godly outfits they want to change anything that's traditional or standard until there's nothing but an entertainment grace to live up no find the godliest of the godliest of the godly because there is a safety they know when you're in danger they can warn you and these young people can't. 1 Peter 5 verse 1, the elders which are among you, I exhort, feed the flock of God, literally shepherd, watch over, guide the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, watch over them, watch out for them, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples of the flock, it doesn't end there, the next verse is, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Those shepherds didn't say, oh, hang on, it's nice here. Don't let me get. They just ran. No, they were dangerous. They didn't ask questions. They followed. Submit yourselves to the elder. Hebrews 13, verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your soul. They that must give account. They may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Ezekiel 3 verse 17, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. The preachers say this is to preach the unsaved, to warn the unsaved. No. In its context, it's for the people of God. I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel, to my people. Therefore, thou shalt hear the word in my mouth and warn them, warn them from me. That is staggering to me. The elders are there like those giraffes for us to be watched over, that they warn us of the dangers that they know because they've reached spiritual heights that you haven't as young people. We have to. We have to. There's a man sitting here last night in the meeting. His name was Sam Gerber. 
He's gone. He has to go back to the National Fort, Canada, but he was in the first two meetings. Our Sam Gilbert is a very godly man. And last year, I think you all went down there to where it was, and Sam Gilbert was there. And I was preaching, and he came up to me after one of the meetings, and he said, Mr. Daniel, Brother Daniel, I have an illustration for you that I want you to preach. I haven't told other preachers, but I want to give this as this happened, but this really happened. And I want you to preach. But I don't know what to say. He said, okay. He said, years and years ago, where he was in a situation, there were two little boys playing up in the hills. One laughing, jumping over the rocks and cliffs and down. And they picked up these things. And they found strange things, you know, and they were standing and laughing and throwing them to each other. But there were men down the valley who were screaming frantically to these young boys. Screaming. The young boys were, what are they doing? They're speaking to us. What is this? You see, those men with roadworks they put dynamite. It was ignited just years ago. And these boys didn't see the signs warning. They were all over with the roadworks. They came on the other side of the hills, playing. And they found these dynamite sticks and all these things and began to play with them, holding them and laughing. And these men down there realizing the boys are about to be killed. They will be blown to pieces. Within minutes, within seconds, they, they were crying, scream, scream, when they realized these boys were, had picked up all these things. And the wind just blew away what they were saying. The boys said, they must be screaming. Let's hope they could realize this. They're frantic. They're all screaming in unison. Fear. What are they saying? It's to us. Suddenly the wind died. Voices came. Throw it away! Throw it away! They tried to stop the weeping because I believe in relation to those voices. Throw it away! Throw it away! And suddenly, they heard it. Throw it away. And they threw over this part that was like a cliff to suit. One boy. Men for life, it's like a vegetable. The other was badly wounded, but he eventually, through operations and therapy, he was able to recover and lead almost a normal life. Oh, brothers, young people, that is what the elders are required by God to do, or they will give account to war of the dangers. To warn in such a way that the young people will realize they're in danger. They'll be unnerved because we will give account if we don't do with all our heart and soul. Our hearts is worth throbbing with God's love. Yes, but with such earnestness, throw it away. Lord, we have to warn as elders, no matter what offense comes in this day of liberal thinking. We have to, we will give account if we don't stand wherever we can to protect and watch all the young that are in the faith in such a way they know they're in danger. Know ye not that even a little leaven, leaven at the whole lot, young man, that's going to happen. Throw it away. What fellowship has light with dark? Throw us away! Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Throw it away, man! Abstain from all appearance of evil, young man. Not just to go into an appearance that in your heart. If you're dressed, throw us away! Said, be changed, change your mind. Be holy. 
coming out from among the bees separate. Throw this away, deal with this young man. He's in danger of losing everything and bringing disgrace on God's name. Submit now. God says, we watch over your soul, not to rule over you. Throw this away now. And if we as preachers, and we as elders, no matter who you are, don't warn to unnerve them and place fear in their hearts because of the love attached to the throbbing love of God in our words. Not just man made stand sir, but God's word to tell them with no compromise. We will give account to God. We dare not cut ourselves off or sever ourselves from abiding relationship with Christ, from deep communion with Christ, which is imperative for our survival as a Christian according to this book and Christ's words and sound. And we dare not defy God and cut ourselves off from communion, fellowship, meaningful fellowship, allowing it to mold us and to emulate them, to stay safe. For they watch over your souls as they that will give account if they don't. Can we stand, please? Well, in the shock of most of all of everything I've said, what you do with this uh, is what you want from God the rest of your life. And if you don't stop now, I guarantee you it's very difficult chance that you're going to do anything about your condition because you don't want to change. So what you don't seek God to do now, I doubt you ever will. No matter what you become, a tragedy while you name the name of Christ to everyone that knows you till you die. Be careful. I doubt that you don't start seeking God for these two things, yes, as the greatest discipline in your life day, wherever you can. I doubt that you never will, though you will be a living tragedy, I guarantee you, young boy, young man, pastor, professing Christian, I don't care who you are, I guarantee you. You will be a living tragedy while you talk about Jesus to others. Bring it out, John. Be careful now. Be careful, young ladies. God's looking at your heart. We don't see it. Young men, God's looking at your mind. Your heart. We not. God will know. Tonight I was going to preach you a sermon, just close to 200 verses that I memorized in the Bible, which is my ministry, up to 70% of every sermon I've preached since in 47 years. It's just having memorized the books of the Bible and the passages of every facet, which the only reason God opened the door to cross this nation and other nations. Otherwise, I would never ever lift my nation for no reason, because I've got nothing. But he honors his word above all things. Now, I have preached many sermons of the scriptures, which have been downloaded and viewed across the whole world in the hundreds of thousands if you look carefully across all these websites. And I thank God for that. But I didn't bring the sermon that particularly God burned in my heart tonight for circumstances that I know God knew would happen. But I immediately thought of this sermon. But I want to ask you something. Many, many websites, Seven Index, Seven Audio, and many others, they say there's over 100 websites with many, many, most of my messages over many years. I want you to go and hear. We'll be on there soon. Then this tour was just the main throbbing, burning burden of my heart to give me. I doubt they'll ever allow me back in your country of that, sir. 
and I want you to listen to it. So don't forget now, because that has been what's really given me this year. Driven me on my knees in prayer. Desperation to be anointed by God and ready to bring these words, which have been most of my Please just Google the old man's name and look to this tour of 2014 in America. Just look to what sermons there are, including this one. You'll find a lot. One is just the scriptures. On a topic that I don't think any other preacher on earth has ever preached on, but if he has, it hasn't been the scriptures, which is why people are being very, very unnerved at the most unexpected sources everywhere, rising up against us. But my safety is, is God's word. If God's word is allowed in the book of as it stands. If you're not saved, trust me, eternity never ever ceases. Nor will you torment if you play the fool of eternity and you know through this message that I address to say whether you need to seek God desperately for true salvation and then do what I preach tonight for God's sake every day and life till you die. <coughs> If you don't, if you have a chance of the tenter, you'll never forget this sermon. I guarantee as you lie now, you will never ever cease to be a to remember God's final belief. Who can? With eternity, I'm blessed. Oh, be. A new Christian. These two things, God as God's, we will survive. Not to become a disgrace and tragedy. Brother, would you commit us to God? You stand here. No appeal. <coughs> I come back. That would be amazing. I hope I do. We'll see. Otherwise, pray for me. Yes, the years that is. I'm a young man. Thanks, so no. You stand at the door and you say, Take this, please. No one's allowed to do it without it. You're not taking a prayer for us. And that prayer is all I want to do. Nothing else. I want to cover it. If you're listening, if you want to, be there for a few minutes. Pin, list. If you want to put your names down, we'll send email or. Small groups also. Despise not the day of small things in God's sight, this might be more meaningful than the groups that have thousands of your many best to. So, brother, pray for us now. Thank you for inviting me. And everyone that came, thank you for coming. God be with you now. <laughs>